Right. Uh, once again, welcome everyone. Thank you very much indeed for attending this Vulcan Experience Day here at uh, the former RAF game, obviously now home to the Heritage Motor Centre. And firstly, on behalf of the Trust, uh, I would like to say a big thank you for the team here, particularly Emma and Joanne and John, who've really gone the extra mile to slot this in at fairly short notice, as I'm sure you'll all appreciate. And I think a nice round of applause, please, because they've done a tremendous job. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really glad to the Sky Trust here today, and I'm sure Robert will probably say a few words later in that regard anyway. But for now, just a quick introduction. My name is Ian Homer, and I have the, uh, the honour to be your MC tonight. I'm actually the marketing manager for the Welcome to the Sky Trust, and uh, it's pleasure to, to MC this event to try and keep things running smoothly and I'll obviously introduce the speakers to you. But just a rough running order for you for now. We'll start with Robert and he will do uh, a 45 minute or so presentation and then we'll take a question and answer session from the floor. Uh, myself or a colleague will come around with a radio mic so the whole room can hear so uh, hopefully you can answer, uh, ask the questions you desire. The other gentleman you saw here uh, earlier was Barry Maysfield, some of you might have seen earlier. Uh, he will come on stage around about 6.30. Uh, we then go through to about 7.15 and another question and answer session, if there's anything else uh, that crops up. And 7.30 we'll then take a break. There'll be plenty of refreshments outside. There'll be a merchandise table, obviously a nice toilet break for people. Uh, and we'll have a good 45 minute break. And at quarter past eight, we're being joined by Martin Withers, um, who has been commentating at the Old Warden display today, so he's making his way back here to be with us for about 8.15. And then we'll go through, we'll have an hour with Martin, another question and answer session for anyone who's here. And we finish with obviously any signing or any book signing that you want. Uh, so that's the general running order, so please, hopefully you'll enjoy that. Uh, but for now, it gives me great pleasure really to introduce, certainly the, I think you might, if anyone was hearing Sean's commentary today, there have been several key people along the line for XA558. Uh, David Walton was obviously instrumental in buying it from the RAF. But really, the fact that we're here today, 55 years after the aircraft was built, and a full 22 years since she retired from the RAF, is really down to this gentleman here, Dr. Robert Fleming. So please, a round of applause. Well, good afternoon, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be with you today. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, the sound levels right. Good, great. Um, phew, it's been quite an afternoon actually. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, a couple of questions for you. Who has travelled the furthest to be here? Has anybody travelled from overseas to be here today? Ah, uh -huh. Yeah, how far have you travelled? Only, only Geneva. Can anybody be in Geneva? <laughs> Welcome, sir. That's brilliant. Um, I'd also like to uh, say a few thank yous to our team of volunteers who uh, uh, have helped out this afternoon. I've got a list here, uh, just read out their names because without the help of the uh, volunteers, we wouldn't be able to deliver events like this to you. And so, uh, in no order at all, we've got to Edward Banks, um, Hayley Rowlandson, Ian Hedgeman, Brian Shetlock, Cliff Collins, Toby and Faye Eaves, Paul Smith, Steve Smith, John Wood, Alan Hayward, Robert Brumbles, Paul Williams, Erica and Paul Whitaker, John and Kay Prestige, Nick Sarchett, uh, Alf McGill, Brian Hoyle, Charles Brimson and Sally, and Bob and Izzy Jackson. Uh, thank you to all of those people for all their efforts today and over the past uh, years in supporting our <laughs> uh, What I've asked, been asked to do today is, is provide you with something like a 45 minute run through of the highlights in the season and what we're planning uh, for the future for 558 and other activities. 
I hope that's what you'd like to see, because that's certainly what I've got here. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll push on, um, but I just, just wanted to start with last year, because last year was a very successful year, and it's a bit of a highlight year, uh, certainly for, for me and for 558. We had a very successful flying season, we only missed uh, one sortie because of the weather, otherwise uh, it was really, uh, really great. Uh, for um, the last couple of years or so, we've been uh, wanting to film and video and uh, take pictures of 558 as much as we can. And last year we had a simply stunning piece of video uh, shot on the uh, sortie, uh, the transit from F uh, Fairford to Yeovilton, 21st of July. And it's hopefully... Uh, in, at the end of August, and then we had a couple of 
uh, technical issues, technical issues that didn't turn out to be as disastrous as they might have done uh, at um, Press Street at the air, air show. We had a problem with the nose gear, but uh, diligent um, follow, following of operational procedures solved that problem. And on the subsequent display, sadly, we had an indication of a fuel leak, which again turned out to be an indication problem rather than a real fuel leak, but we have to take no risks at all. Otherwise, it's been an incredibly successful year. I thought I'd share uh, two or three of the uh, really important sites uh, during the year with you for this review of the season. Uh, the first one was at Yeovilton when we flew with the C Vixen and a couple of friends in the famous V Ford formation. Um, that, was a, that was a great air show and one that uh, I think people who were there will remember for a lot of the time. Is anybody down at Yeovilton? Oh, brilliant. It was a lovely sight. Um, the, the second highlight of the year following that was this. <laughs> Who was at Briette on the Saturday? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was uh, Kev Rubens. Um, I, I have to apologise at this point. I, I should explain. We had a real problem. My laptop is too modern and it didn't work with the projector, so she retrofitted the presentation onto. Uh, this, this laptop. Uh, but I do have here a, a video, um, some of which you may have seen on YouTube, of that display. I need to explain, it's 13 minutes long, but it is really worth watching. Uh, there are certain points during the video that you'll, you'll, uh, you'll recognize. Um, do watch at the end, because this is the unexpurgated version. The one on YouTube has got a couple of things chopped out from it because they were a bit naughty. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the unexpurgated version, and if anybody's got a video camera, could they not video this? <laughs> uh, but I thought it was worth showing you the full thing, because it is uh, one of the moments I thought we really captured very well with the in cockpit cameras and the, uh, the um, GoPro that looks out through the um, bomb -headers. Window. But here we are. This is the Saturday at Rio. I know it was 13 minutes, but I hope you thought it was worth it. <laughs> uh, I think that was probably the best ever display I've seen of the Falcon, uh, certainly since its return to fire. Of Kev, Kev Rubens was flying the display, and he was sitting on the, the right as you saw the cockpit. Uh, with Bill Ramsey on the, on the left. Um, that is the unexpurgated version, as I mentioned. Uh, you didn't see us going inverted, did you? <laughs> um, extraordinary. I'm so pleased I saw it. Uh, so I hope you would enjoy that as well. Uh, later on in that flight, we um, came back and flew in formation with the, uh, the Reds. Uh, that famous picture, uh, one of two times this year that we've um, the information for us. Uh, I'll show you a little bit more about that later. But this year we've done a lot of airspace photography. Virtually every source here is involved in meeting up with one or other photo ship uh, with uh, photographers on board. Uh, and there have been two <coughs> shots. This is uh, East Boy, you can see the clips right there behind her. Um, this is from the same sortie showing the contrails from the aircraft. Uh, John Dibbs does a, some really brilliant uh, air to air photography. This is one of his with the cloudscape in the background. Um, these, uh, these photographs will be made available to you in various ways, either individually or as uh, sort of albums of uh, 558 in flight over the last couple of years. So I look forward to these. These will be coming out, uh, I guess, over the Christmas period. Where's Ian? It's not here at the moment. <laughs> Um, but you'll see, you'll be able to uh, have copies of these in due course. This one was actually captured yesterday, it's 558, not August, not Friday. 558 with two uh, GR4s, um, really from uh, the, the, the old bomber and the two modern bombers. Um, this was uh, uh, done after the uh, dedication of the new uh, Spire at the International Bomber Command Center uh, at Lincoln. Uh, for which uh, 558 uh, flew a uh, flight past and then a, a zoom climb. Really was a, a brilliant day, uh, lovely weather and uh, what an atmosphere, 300 
for the surviving members of Bomber Commander there, and it was it was quite an emotional day. Uh, from there, I just thought I'd show you this. This is where we've been this year. Um, this is uh, we've got a, a piece of equipment called PFLAM on the aircraft now, which actually is a way of ensuring that we can see gliders and other light aircraft. Uh, but the nice thing it does actually records where we've gone in any particular year. And this is a this is a consolidation of all of the tracks uh, around the country this year. So we, you can see the penetrated pretty much everywhere in the UK. Um, but this is rather nice one. This is from the <coughs> one on YouTube, but again, it's a lovely. Um, this is the Bomber Commander. Just to say that we do not yet have a date <laughs> for the final flight. 
And this, this is my Ethiopian friend with a natural velcro mark on his chest. He says, Galada. You can see how happy he is. <laughs> um, we, we still uh, have um, plans to fly after the national tour. The dates for those are going to be increasingly dependent on weather, air availability, and the rest. But there will be further flights after this, uh, this coming weekend. Uh, we'll let you know as, uh, as soon as it's possible. Uh, but right now, uh, just to put up these statistics, 222 flights all in all, 332 flying hours. That's uh, well in excess of what we promised the Heritage Lottery Fund when we got the grant back in 2004 uh, five. We actually only promised 250 flying hours at that point. Um, and that was at the rate of 25 hours per year. In fact, we've been flying 40, 50 flying hours per year. This year is an exception. Uh, that will go up by about 50%. So by the time we finish flying, we'll have flown for about 75 hours this year. Um, the aircraft is well in excess of 10% more than any other Vulcan in terms of flying life, uh, which is one of the factors which has led to us having to stop flying this year. But that said, we do fly in front of over 2.5 million people every year at a cost of about 2.5 million pounds. So in my money, it's a pound of smile. And that's, I think, the way we should all look at it. Um, moving forward, one day this month, there will be the final landing. Uh, it's uh, inevitable. We've always known about it since we started. This will be the case. But we think there's an exciting future. Uh, firstly, to confirm that 558 will be kept in ground running condition. She will be doing fast taxis down the wrong way of the uh, she will be kept on the RAF's anti-deterioration cycle, so we'll run the engines every 28 days, but will be kept as uh, in as good a condition as we possibly can. Uh, one of the things we're having to sort out in coming uh, coming six months or so is what we do with our 600 tons of spares, which we only need a limited number of those uh, to keep the aircraft uh, in ground-running condition. So if you uh, feel like bidding for bits of Vulcan, they're incredibly well packaged. Um, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll be talking about that some more. Uh, the other thing we want to do, uh, which is very much um, in the minds of my board and the rest of the team, we've obviously <coughs> created a model which works in terms of keeping the Vulcan flying. We have huge numbers of supporters. All you hear a testament to that, but we actually distribute an email um, update to uh, nearly 89,000 people twice a week, which is an extraordinary following. We have large numbers on Facebook, more than the Reds, <laughs> um, uh, and on Twitter as well. Social media has been really important to us. It's a, mo it's a model that, that we've found works, and what we want to do, and actually what we've been asked to do by other members of the flying heritage movement in the UK is actually take this model and see how we can support other uh, heritage aircraft in, in flying state. So watch this space. The discussions on this are current. I've had three or four meetings now with um, key people in um, the flying uh, heritage uh, movement, you know, different individuals with different, uh, with different aircraft. But, uh, I'd like to think that you all would like to continue to be involved with flying all their cars as well as uh, the Dexate 558 itself. I don't know how you feel, but would you be willing to come with us in future aircraft projects? Yeah. 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 Good for you. That's great. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, some ideas that we will present in due course. Um, it'll be quite soon. We come and tell you. As the second thing, there are four things that we've got. Uh, in plans for the future. First one is con con continuing to taxi XH558 and provide a parking experience up at Robin Hood. The second one uh, is the involvement with other uh, vintage veteran uh, heritage aircraft that are flying. The third one is what we're doing with Aviation Skills Partnership in setting up the Valkyrie Aviation Academy and Heritage Centre. And that's actually moving quite fast. The first cohort of engineering students has actually started at Doncaster College. Uh, so we will see more of this in the short term. There's a fairly major announcement coming the week after next, so I hope I'll be able to tell you more then. Um, that uh, is 
going to be built here. This is the northern part of Robin Hood Airport. You can just see the runway just there. That's the end of the runway. Uh, that there is Hangar 3, where 558 is. That's Hangar 3, just there. 558 is the situation. And this area here, the trapeziums, there is where Peel Airports have identified a whole lot of land, about 30,000 square meters of land, for us to build whatever we want to build. There, and it will have runway access. You can see there's uh, um, almost uh, sufficient access there at the moment, but that will be upgraded to allow us to access the runway from that site. So exciting times ahead. Um, and the nice thing is the local authority, the Doncaster Municipal Borough Council and the Sheffield City Region uh, Local Enterprise Partnership are all on side on, on these plans because Doncaster, frankly, is an educationally weak area. It's in the fourth quartile of educational achievement <laughs> uh, in the country. So uh, we're very welcomed by people who need to support us. Um, the, thing that, uh, the fourth thing that we have in mind, which is something I have very, uh, hold very strongly, is actually helping to solve the engineering skills challenge in the UK by basically inspiring youngsters to get involved with engineering and technology. Uh, but we've devised a, a project called the Edna Project, which uh, Ian Homer, oh, sorry, Phil Mavic mentioned today, um, which is all about uh, using, leveraging the interest the young have shown in the aircraft by getting them involved with other working technologies, really uh, working to gain the, their interest and those are the people who influence them. <coughs> one, of the problems, one of the sad problems that we've got in this country is that uh, certainly at primary school, uh, youngsters really don't get exposed to engineering and technology in the way they should. And that's one of the things that we're working on. Um, as a side interest, interest side responsibility, I should say, I'm also not only a chief executive here at BTS, but I'm also a trustee of Young Engineers, which brings me face to face with some of the issues that uh, we've got in this country about getting more youngsters into engineering. So, um, what we've got is initially just some drawings about a new centre with the Edna project, well, like the Eden project, uh, but with, with uh, new uh, dynamic working exhibits to show uh, the youngsters all about uh, the things that they can get up to in their career in engineering. Uh, these are only uh, obviously concept drawings, but we've had, we still have working technology in exhibition halls and the ability to uh, produce uh, hands on activities for youngsters. Um, and this is where we will taxi the aircraft. Um, we'll have other, other aircraft in there as well. So exciting times. And I'm working. We've been working with a set of consultants now for some 12 months or so on devising the business plan. And now we're, we've got a scoping study that's underway. Uh, so moving forward, it's all positive stuff. <coughs> that was really all I was going to say about the future. We'll let you all know how things develop in, in due course for the usual, usual ways. But uh, I must have finished really on uh, the second flight that we had with the Red Arrows. This was at Southport recently. And we've got a lovely piece of video here that you may have seen, but I have um, uh, my make note on apologies on showing it uh, to you again. But it's, uh, a brilliant piece of formation flying between us and um, with us and the Red Arrows.
Councillor, and thanks for those planning to say today. I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the session. I apologize for using a fair amount of video, but I thought it was so good it was worth airing again. Um, I think you can find most of those on YouTube, but certainly not in the definition I was showing them today. Um, we hope that some of them may come out in a different format or something. Um, but thank you for your attention. I've done run about up five minutes, sorry for that. Um, but I'm uh, very happy to answer any questions you might have now. Okay, yeah, if we could just have a show of hands, and then obviously I'll bring uh, the microphone over to this side of the room. Uh, my wife kindly is over that side of the room, so we'll try and get everyone in. So bear with me, and I'll just show you those things. I'll just, who was spoke first? Yourself, didn't you? Just this gentleman here. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes. <laughs> and my question is that uh, at uh, Wallington, you've got 607, which seems to be facing some years of neglect. Are there any plans to uh, perhaps even cosmetically do something with that one? I'm, I'm not aware of any plans to do anything with 607. She is in a very sorry state. And sadly, this is what happens when you put aircraft of this era out in the weather. Um, we have had a look at her, and there is a very significant corrosion. I'm personally concerned that they'll suddenly decide it's unsafe to keep her there, and she'll be chopped up. Uh, which would be a real shame. Uh, this, is, this is an MOD RAF decision, and certainly I'm not aware of any, any plans to do anything with them. It does seem a great shame, considering that was the one that uh, was the first one to get to the problems, but uh, it seems that um, the RAF didn't care too much about it. Mm. <laughs> 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 I have to agree with that comment. Here's the result of that. Those gentlemen here, I Getting kids involved with um, engineering is incredibly important. Mm. Have you had any discussions with Richard Norton, <coughs> which has similar aims? I know, I know Richard quite well, actually. We've, um, we've discussed our, uh, our, our projects. Um, of, of course, uh, when, when we were discussing exactly on the fundraising topic, uh, but he has done uh, a really good job of interesting people um, around the country in Bloodhound and their project. Um, I, I have to say that I do know that uh, once Bloodhound has succeeded or not with their aim of passing a thousand miles an hour, Richard's going to basically move on from the whole of that. So there's really no long-term legacy that he's planning to leave in the educational sense, which is very different from the approach that we've got. Uh, indeed, I, I do know that he's planning, assuming, as an engineer, I actually worry quite a lot about that, that car because I think they're, 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 they're taking enormous risks. Um, but that's only a personal, personal view. But assuming it's successful, I think he's planning to sell the car off to pay off some of the tips that the project managed to um, acquire over time. But no, I do, I do know Richard. I, I admire what he's done around with the various schools around the country. Yeah. Thank you. Gentlemen, we'll the question, then we'll, we'll ask for any more. We'll probably take some from the left hand side of the room as well. You, you, is it working? Right. You managed to successfully get back into the air a large, complicated delta wing aircraft. <laughs> there is another large, complicated <laughs> 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 the trust hasn't got the 120 million. So. Uh, I, I've been asked as many times. It, uh, some, the same as the, the Concorde um, team uh, have uh, asked for our advice on a number of occasions. Um, firstly, the two technologies are very different. Uh, the Vulcan, given the way it was designed, is actually a remarkably simple aircraft. Uh, the reason why it's de a designated complex. Um, by the CAA is, is, a, is a couple of rather specialised things. It firstly it had no manual reversion on the flying controls. You have to, they are electrically powered flying controls. Um, that puts them into the conflict category. And there are also some um, aids to stability. So there's an auto tremor, there's a yaw damper, etc. And all of these things 
put it into the complex category. But just flying, it relies on brute force and a very strong wing. And that's about it. Concord, though, is a completely different set of technologies. Uh, it has uh, hydraulically powered flying controls, for example. The, the problem with the Concord project is that they started, they've started from a different position than we started. Uh, when I kicked this off in 1997, the first thing I did was to understand the CAA regulations and how we could fly it on fly it above and on the civil register. And that understanding led us down to persuading BA Systems, or British Aerospace that was BA Systems that is now, to support the project as the first milestone along the path. Without that support, there's no point in going any further. If they're not going to support it, you're not going to be allowed to fly the aircraft. Uh, and so it is with Concorde. They require the support, the technical support of Airbus to fly the aircraft. And Airbus have said consistently, we will not support the flight of Concorde. And that is the huge stumbling block that they've got. If they could turn that one over, then yeah, just throw money at it. But at the moment, there's no legal way they can find the aircraft without support of Airbus and Rolls-Royce and a number of other manufacturers. That's where we are with Concorde. Thank you, Robert. There's another question here. And uh, any questions on the left-hand side of the room? Yeah, we'll come to you now, and then we'll come back over here if needed. I'm just thinking about um, older aircraft now, and certainly other aircraft. We've got a Lancaster up uh, in East Kirby. Yep. Uh, the two brothers, sadly well, one of the brothers died. Absolutely. But the two Kirby, the two brothers wanted to get this Lancaster flying. Um, have you got any thoughts about supporting it? We're talking. <coughs>
probably end up having to do is, is quite short notice. If we've got the crew and the weather's okay tomorrow, we'll go. That sort of thing. Uh, but we are thinking about that. This has been flavored by uh, one of the sand events, traffic events at Shore. Um, to be honest, the display that we did today was strictly illegal. <laughs> Only from CAA here, isn't it? <laughs> uh, we, we, we actually are limited to 60 degrees angle of bank and we went well over that. Um, it's, it's, it's something which has concentrated the, the minds of local authorities and the police around the country. Uh, we have had some very serious conversations with the emergency planning, emergency planners for the MBC, sorry, the Doncaster Municipal Borough Council and South Yorkshire Police in the last few days and basically they've, they've told us that if the crowds around the airport get to the point where they don't think they can control the crowd, they will shut the airport. They will execute the emergency plan that will be, the, that will be it's in place for a major incident at the airport. Uh, and sadly, um, the way things are, or the trust will be liable for the costs of any associated Lost to the left. So, if airlines can't land or if they can't take off or if passengers can't make it into the terminal building, uh, we'd have to foot the bill, which is not something we want to do. So, we've had to listen very hard to what we're being told, which has resulted in um, us having to manage the final flight quite carefully. Um, I do, there will be a final flight. Uh, I don't think it was today. Uh, but it will be sometime later on this month, and we'll let you know if we can. Thank you. Good question. I think there was one more over there, wasn't there? No? Any more questions over that side of the room? No, there's one here. I'll come to the middle in a moment. I think there's just one. If we just do the left, and we'll come to the middle. A few more on the, the right-hand side of the room, and I think that'll be about it. Hi. Uh, you really came from Brunton Thorpe, and there's not to the other big one over there. Was it really considered to move it back to Brunton Thorpe? Or was it always suspects and probably hold? There, there are a number of factors which went into the decision um, for Robin Hood. Um, the, the, we, are, we as a charity have a duty to look after the asset in perpetuity. And the facilities that we've been afforded at Robin Hood and the attitude of Peel Group, etc., um, and the local authority uh, does give us rights to complete confidence that that's a permanent home for her. Uh, it, is, it is an international airport um, that creates a little bit of difficulty, but it's something that we know we can work around. Uh, Bruntingthorpe uh, is privately owned. Uh, it's owned by the Seawater Limited family company. And as such, you don't know what might happen if that company uh, was to finish, was to go into liquidation or whatever. Uh, my concern is that um, that is a risk. Uh, the, the runway at Bruntingthorpe isn't uh, in really good condition. Uh, there is, we don't want to have any fog problem with stones ingested into the engines or anything like that. Um, the, the, other, the other factor is that the, um, uh, the catchment area of Robin Hood is far better than the Bruntingthorpe. Uh, with the creation of the Fars link road, that's the uh, link road from the airport to the M18, it will make the catchment area several million people in an hour's travel, which is not the case at the <coughs> Bronte Hill. Um, so that's basically where, where we are. A number of factors that uh, you have to consider on this sort of decision. Okay, thank you. There was a, uh, I think there were a few questions here. We do need to uh, watch the time, so if we can try and there we are. Yeah. So, in terms of the historic, the aim to try and actually support British historic aircraft going forward, mm -hmm. I don't know whether that is supporting those that are still flying or trying to bring those that are recently grounded back into the air. There's lots of, well, there's not lots, there's a few people who are trying to bring the lightning back into the air in South Africa today very effectively. As that sort of similar generation to the Vulcan, is that the sort of. And sadly, we know the answer about the lightning in the UK. Um, there are several things that um, the CAA look at. One of the major things is the safety record of the type in service. And we know already that the leading the lightning has been 
unsatisfactory in terms of its safety record in the service. So we'll never find these again. Despite the fact it's flown in South Africa relatively, I know they've had one accident. <laughs> 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 right, uh, one more here. Okay, sorry, hang on. We'll do this side. Okay. This might be a question everybody has the answer to. Uh, the commentator today said there were no technical reasons why the Vulcan couldn't keep on flying. Uh, it was down to the lack of support from BAE, from Marshalls and from Rolls-Royce. Can you just say a little bit more about why they decided not to support it? Uh, do they need lobbying by more people? Um, we, you know, if there's no technical reason, we'd like to see how we can um, get around that. Um, Thank you. There is no technical reason why we can't fly on for, I would guess, probably about another year, possibly, possibly longer. Uh, we're limited by uh, engine life. Sadly, Rolls-Royce decided to use a modern lifing algorithm rather than the original RAF 2000-hour uh, TBO um, life. Uh, but the, the reason that um, BA systems, Rolls-Royce and Marshalls consistently gave to us is that they don't have the competency to support the, uh, the aircraft. Uh, personally, I find that a little bit difficult to believe. Uh, I think the real reason which they weren't meant to is probably corporate risk aversion, uh, insurance, and all these other things which modern corporations look at. Uh, it's true to say there's no upside for them. Um, there's no shareholder value on them supporting the fight for the market. And you can see why this has probably been driven by business considerations, corporate governance, etc. Uh, we haven't been told that's the case. They've always kept firmly to the line that we don't have the competency, we won't have the competency. Um, as to whether or not a lobbying campaign could change their minds, uh, I actually don't know. I, I, I feel it's probably, it probably wouldn't work, but it all depends on volumes of people, I guess. Would more money make a difference? That was the question, so would more money make a difference? No, well, I don't know. With m money, uh, to be honest, we have a model that works as it does funding uh, for Five, five, Gentleman here. Okay, thanks. I actually work for Rolls-Royce, so I own the ditch while I'm out again. I'm in the yeah. Darby division, not the rest of the world. <laughs> uh, it wasn't really a question, it's just echoing what the number of people said. Just thank you for what you've done uh, over the last seven years. Only the three inspired engineers in the future, very important. Thank you. Thank you. I'll then tell you what's going to happen for the major break. So, another question. Um, I have a question to you. You mentioned uh, getting the service involved in uh, aviation and engineering, especially. Um, my question, or perhaps observation, is that it seems to me that we have allowed aircraft manufacturing to move to the continent. And getting youngsters very interested in, in aircraft uh, engineering. Going to be very difficult unless we, yeah. or some way, bring it back. I didn't, uh, I didn't mention it in my talk today, but of course we are seeing the end of a major chapter in British aviation. 558 is the, you, you all know, it's the last full British four-engine jet aircraft flying in the world. And once she stops flying, it's the end of an era. Um, I'd love for there to be more focus on complete aircraft projects in the UK, but you're right, we just build this in a week and things like that, but we, 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 we don't integrate full, full aircraft in this country, which I think that's probably the way the industry has gone, and there are two major manufacturers in the world now, it's Boeing and, and Airbus, and it's a huge undertaking, vast sums of money involved. Yeah, I mean, obviously the development costs are just huge. I think there's just one more question here, and I'm afraid that's going to be the last one for now. Thank you. Um, going back to Concorde, when British Airways said they weren't going to allow it to fly anymore, they seemed to underline that by selling off all the spares, which I always thought was an example of corporate vandalism, since we taxpayers paid for that. Um, I just wonder, you mentioned earlier that you were planning to sell off the spares for Vulcan. There was no way I could 
accusing you of corporate protection. <laughs> I'm just asking, is it wise to sell off? Because that really does un put the money in the different terms. We, we will keep um, a large number of spares, but we don't need sort of 50 versions of one pipe. That's the thing. Um, the other thing you need to realize is that um, having moved away from flying aircraft, uh, it's an awful lot easier then to reverse engineer or um, remanufacture parts for the aircraft um, if, if, if needed, because they don't need to be of airworthiness standard. So things get rather easier. Um, but we've got literally hundreds of thousands of rivets and all unbelievable set of them. Um, we also put a picture of the stores on the website. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's a project before Christmas. There's, there's 16,000 individual line items, of which we may have hundreds in each, in each particular car number. It's a huge asset. Yes. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid that is the time limit that we've already extended by 10 minutes to try and get as many questions in as possible. Um, but for now, Robert, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much again. Thank you, uh, Robert.